Hello, and welcome. Today we're going to review some poker. So we have lined up this glorious final table. As you can see, we are playing seven-handed. Here are the players. I am pretty familiar with all of these players besides Tilston, who I do not know at all. And then, worth noting, only five people get paid. This is very often the case in high roller tournaments. The other day, I took ninth place in a high roller tournament and I got paid zero dollars. So you can make the final table and still lose. So that's a lot of fun. Um, welcome Ghost of M. I want to say hello to everyone who is here all the time. Let's see, before we get started, I'm going to read you a little bit out of this book called Principles by Ray Dalio. It's a good book. I suggest you read it. We are going to talk about a five-step process to get what you want out of life. It's very important. So important. I um, you know, drew highlights all over the page. So how do you get what you want out of life? I feel like I've implemented these things to some extent, but I certainly could have done better throughout my life. And um, I imagine most of you could do better. Ray claims you can get pretty much anything you want if you follow these five steps. Okay, first, have clear goals. What do you want? Also, it should be, it's worth noting you should do all these things independently from each other. You want to develop your goals before you do other things. And then before you do the other things, you want to have done the previous steps. If you do the previous steps in isolation, often that will make you less emotionally attached and will allow you to make better decisions. It's very important to... Um, Think rationally and clearly. So have clear goals. Next, identify and don't tolerate the problems that stand in the way of achieving those goals. Let's say you wanna get good at poker. What's standing in your way? Well, it could be different for each individual person, right? Um, some people smoke cigarettes all the time and they have to get up and take breaks from the table every 15 minutes because they're addicted to cigarettes. That is a problem that stands in the way of their goal. Some people are really bad at math. Well, they better get good at math, right? These are all things that will c cause you to not be good at poker. And you need to identify, a lot of people say, okay, I realize I'm not good at math, but then also don't tolerate these problems. You have to accurately diagnose these problems, this is number three, and then get to the root of those problems. Why are you not good at math? Well, maybe you had a bad third grade math teacher who didn't teach you anything and you never learned how to multiply. Okay, it is what it is. Now you have to go back and fix your problems. It is up to you. Your problems in life are no one's fault besides your own. While that may not be entirely true, that is the way you have to accept it. Like whenever you get bad beat at a poker tournament, don't blame the dealer or blame variance. That's part of life. You signed up for this. I guess you did not sign up to be born, but presumably you're happier here than elsewhere. All right, number four, design plans that will get you around those problems. We're bad at math, let's say, or we smoke too many cigarettes. If you smoke too many cigarettes to where you can't sit at the table all day, you got to learn to stop smoking cigarettes. It has been proven that that is a possible thing for people to do. I don't know the steps. I haven't had that problem, thank goodness. And get help from others. Learn whatever systems you need to do that. If you're bad at math, you just can't multiply for the life of you, for example. Learn to do math. Take a math class. Read math books. Whatever you need to do. Look it up on YouTube. YouTube will solve almost all of your problems if you just search it, especially um, technical skills. Like the other day, the, the pipe was leaking under the sink. So I Googled how to fix this broken pipe. So then I learned and I went and I fixed the broken pipe, right? Next, finally, do what's necessary to push these designs through to results. You design a solution to your problem and then you follow through and you fix your problems. And if you fix all the problems, you should have no real issues getting, um, getting what you want in life. Sorry, my, one of my partners is messaging me. Just a second. Okay. All right. So that's how you get what you want out of life. I would love all of you to get whatever you want out of life. Um, in poker, I want to be good to the point that I am clearly profitable in the highest stake buy in tournaments. It's a bit of a goal. 
Luckily, I have spent the last 15 years getting to where I'm pretty competent at the game. And um, I feel like we're already there. But you have to understand, if you are not constantly working and striving to get better, you will get left behind. So we don't want to get left behind, so here we are today. All right, like I said, this is the final table of a $50,000 buy-in tournament featuring these players. Um, I don't know anything about Tilson, Tilston, but I do know everyone else. Notice here, though, Tilston has lots of chips. The other players, eh, not so much. We're playing 8K Big Blind, and um, five people remain, I'm sorry, seven people remain, five get paid. So let's get to it. I don't exactly know the table layout, but that's fine. We'll figure it out. Um, it definitely is worth mentioning, though. Like, say, Tilston folds, and then Negranu's left to act. Negranu can now act as the chip stack, as, as the big stack, right? And he can apply pressure to these other stacks. If Tilston has position on Negranu, though, now Negranu can't really open very many hands because when he raises, Tilston, the big stack, is going to be in position to abuse him. So that is definitely very relevant, and we'll figure out stack sizes really quick, or stack positions really quickly. All right, here we are. Carry Cast raises to 18K. With 10 nine of hearts in the cutoff. This is obviously fine. Dan Smith makes it 45K in the small blind with ace jack of diamonds. I'm sorry, 54K. I would probably call in the spot if I was carry. I would really hate it, but the problem with 10 nine of hearts is that it flops really, really, really well. Um, you're gonna have something a lot of the time, and usually something with shallow stacks is good enough to get it in. I'm a little bit surprised Smith just didn't jam all in. Unless he's planning on folding if Carrie Katz shoves. We did mention yesterday that Carrie Katz is a bit on the tighter side. So if we expect him to be on the tighter side, maybe you can justify three betting this and then folding it given we are near the bubble. But I don't think I'm doing that too often. I mean, let's just look at some math real quick. He's going to have to put in... 219 minus 54 equals. He has to put in 165 more to win a 440 plus the blinds and antis. So let's call it 460. So 165 divided by 460 equals. He needs to win 35% of the time. Let's see how Ace Jack of Diamonds does against any sort of reasonable range. Let's assume carries just like really, really nitty and only goes with like the best hands. Let's assume he's shoving this, right? Even against that range, we have 33%. And he's like, no one's going to be tighter than that, right? So if he's 33% against the nittiest range, it needs to be 35% to break even. It's probably fine because I don't imagine Carrie's going to have the nittiest range ever. As his range gets wider, that's going to make Carrie's call, I'm sorry, make um, Smith's call even easier. So I think if you're 3-betting this, you probably have to call it off reluctantly. And if in that scenario, I think you're usually just better off shoving because that's going to make cats fold out some of the bottom hands in his range, like pocket 7s maybe. Or um, it doesn't let him 4-bet it all in with a 10-9 of hearts. Grumpy1 says, his 3-bet from the small blind, doesn't this lean more towards value hands? I don't know what Smith is doing in the small blind. Um, I don't pretend to know what he's doing. But if he's 3-betting this hand, he's probably 3-betting a pretty linear range of something like this for value, maybe. And then he's probably 3-betting some number of bluffs. So what, where is his calling range, right? Maybe, he's, maybe he calls the suited aces. Maybe he 3-bets some of them. Maybe he decides to 3-bet these hands. Maybe he 3-bets um, maybe some of these hands. Maybe he calls with these right in here. Maybe 3-bets some of these hands. I don't really know. Maybe three bets a small pair, maybe he calls with them. I don't know what Smith is doing. Smith seems to be a little bit more call happy than most from the blind, so maybe he's calling some of these hands that I have highlighted as polarized three bets. Maybe he's only three betting linearly. Maybe he's only three betting just a straight up good range. Maybe something like maybe something like this. Thinking that um Cass is gonna call him with all sorts of garbage. I don't know. If you think you're gonna get called a lot from the small blind then you want to 3-bet mostly linearly for value. And that could, even, that could be a tight linear range if you think you're going to get called a lot. Like it could be something like this. And then you have to fold the bottom of it if you get shoved on. So anyway, I, I bet Smith was going to fold this if he gets jammed on, but I sure would hate to fold. And given I would hate to have to fold in this spot, I think shoving's 
what I would have done for sure, but that could easily be a mistake. As you shove more, you get to bluff less often. And um, that's because your bluffs are now risking their whole stack, right? So if you think your opponent is tight, like I think they probably think Katz is, maybe it does make sense to three bet small because you're presuming he's never going to jam without a really, really good hand. Even then, though, we saw if he's jamming only with really, really good hands, you're still close, right? That's the problem. It'd be different if he had like ace-10 offsuit where he could easily fold it to the jam. I, I get that. But I don't really get it with the ace-jack suited. Unless he just planned on calling no problem, then maybe that's the case. All right. Folds around to Marchese in the small blind. He limps with queen-jack suited. Um, small blind strategy, you will find basically all good players pretty much always limp small blind when it folds to them with their playable range. And their playable range is going to be quite wide. Here you have to put in 4K to win the... Um, 20k current pot, so 24k pot. What's 4 divided by 24, right? It's going to be not very much. So do you realize 17% equity with your junky hands? And the answer is yes. Even if the player in the big blind is good, you're still going to raise, or win that often. So very easy call spot. Um, let me just actually take, take a note here. Might as well take notes as I go through this. Weird, not all in three bets. Okay. Um, all right. Marchese limps. Tilston raises with the ace four offsuit. Now, you can definitely raise the best hands for value. And I don't know if ace four is going to fall in that category. I think I'm raising something like this for value most of the time. Maybe something like this. And then I'm raising a bunch of the junkers down here. Stuff like this. Maybe some of the suited junk like these. This is this is roughly how most people are going to be approaching the spot. And then you're checking all the stuff in the middle. Maybe you raise even a few more hands as bluffs. And I think this is going to work out pretty well if you use this strategy. I don't know if ace four necessarily extends this far down. If you raise ace four, that kind of implies you're raising even a few more bluffs and... That starts to get dicey, but hey, some people like dicey spots. Um, okay, so he raises, ace four offsuit. Uh, Marchese decides to call. He does not elect to jam. If you limp and you think the big stack's gonna raise like every hand, then you can maybe limp and then shove. But he probably thinks Tilson's playing reasonably. I don't know Tilson, but he looked like maybe a 35-year-old guy, so he's probably competent, like not a... Not a very bad player by any means. So flop comes king, 10, 7. This is like the nut low flop for Tilston. Because here, if you think about Marchese's limping range and then calling a raise range, it's going to be a lot of medium strength hands. And that's going to be a lot of marginal Broadway hands or suited connectors or ace highs and whatnot. And if you think about that whole range, that whole range just nails this board, king, 10, 7. So... Very easy check and give up for Tilston. I don't think he needs to bet here. He doesn't even have much equity if he bets and gets called. If he bet here, I imagine Marchese probably would have called, assuming he made a normal bet. You don't necessarily want to raise with this draw in particular on this board, because if you raise with Queen Jack on this board and get called, you're usually going to be pretty unhappy. Whereas if you call, you do keep some worse hands in, and also you minimize the risk of going broke, which is very important right now. I'm really thirsty today. I just got back from the gym, so I'm expecting to drink a lot of water. All right. On the turn, turns a queen of diamonds. Tilston now decides to bet. This means Marchese checked his queen jack, right? A lot of people think, oh man, how could you check a queen in this spot? You have a pair. But if you think about this hand, it's very unlikely to get outdrawn, right? Like what? How do you, how do you get outdrawn with queen jack in this spot? Well, your opponent has to already have a pair pretty much. I mean, I guess if a... I'm trying to even think if a, if a jack comes, I guess that's bad. You can get outdrawn, but there's only three of those. And even then you have two pair, which is pretty good. So this is a spot where I think uh, Marchese does not need to bet for protection. So he's betting straight up for value thinking. If he does bet, I'm saying, if he does bet, it kind of implies he's thinking that he's going to get called by a lot of worse hands. And I think you can get called by a lot of worse hands, like a 10, maybe even a 7. I think those we'll call a small bet, but I think you're also going to induce bluffs from a lot of stuff. 
So this seems like a great spot to check and look to call any bet. And that is what he does. He checks. Tilston bets small, which is interesting. Um, when you are bluffing, and he is here, you want to make sure you have two sizes, at least two sizes on the turn. You want to have one big size for your nuts and one small size for your marginal made hands. So when you're doing that, you want to be bluffing sometimes, right? You want to have some bluffs in both ranges. This is where a lot of amateur players go wrong. They bet big with their nuts and some bluffs, but they only bet small with marginal made hands, and that's it. They're never bluffing. What are the best hands to bluff in this spot? Well, it's going to be hands that can get called and somehow still win some portion of the time. And that's mainly going to be ace high in this scenario. So very, very good hand to use as a bluff for Tilston, assuming he wants to bluff. I don't know if he needs to bluff ace high, but... It can't be that bad, right? Because you're, you're going to get called by some random junker draw sometimes. And um, I like it. I think it's a good, I think it's a very good size and a very good bluff spot. All right, Rivers of Nine. Now, Marchese checks again with the straight. Oh my God, he has a straight and he checks. Can you believe it? What if his opponent checks behind? Well, if he has a good hand, he may call a bet. But if he has a good hand, he may also just value bet in the spot on the river, even though there's a four straight. Also, if Tilson's bluffing, then you definitely don't want to lead because you let him fold, right? So good check by Marchese. Tilson bets 75K, and Marchese just calls. Um, this is kind of an interesting just call. The question is, can you get called by worse if you raise? Notice here, Marchese only has 250, right? So after this bet of 75 plus another 50, so that's 125, Marchese only has 125K remaining. I, I think you should probably be jamming in this spot, although I don't really see a whole lot of bluffs available. I mean, there are bluffs available, but I don't really see Marchese or any reasonable human wanting to bluff in the spot just because it's so easy for Tilston to have a jack. He could just have the ace jack. I get that. The question really is, is will Tilston ever call a shove with two pair? If you think he's going to fold with two pair, then it probably makes sense to not shove. But if you think he's going to call with two pair, then, or even like ever call with two pair, you, I think you definitely need to shove. Obviously, you're chopping a lot, but that's fine. No one's folding a chop. I think it's almost free to jam in the spot. You block ace jack. There's 12 combinations of those. And then there's just a whole boatload of combinations of other hands, right? Um, I mean, there's there's king queen, which makes a lot of sense. There's king 10 that makes some sense as a slow play. There's a lot of, basically all the all the hands make, make some sense. So I, I think it's important to at least consider shoving. I do get why he just calls though. Maybe at end game he had a read that he thought Tilston had a good hand which is a good reason not to shove. Um, Lucky Eva says, why doesn't Marchese raise on the river? Well, he's, he's concerned about ace-jack, right? He probably thinks in the spot on the river, he's only getting called by a jack or ace-jack, or maybe like sets, and he probably thinks sets are unlikely because those would probably bet the flop, right? So it's kind of hard to find calling hands that are, wor that are um, worse than two pair, and the two pair may fold anyway. Also, a lot of the two pair would just want to bet the flop, right? If you had king, queen, or king, nine, you think you would just bet the flop. So I get why I just called. There is a lot of value in not going broke near the bubble. Remember, there are seven people left and five get paid. So I'm a little bit surprised that he decided to conserve the 20, uh, 125K stack, which is only 15 big blinds. If he had more, I would be happier not jamming. But I think with this stack size, I'm probably just going for it. But he doesn't. And I'm going to assume he's better than me. It's important to understand that we're here to learn, not to tell other people what to do. I get the just the justification of just calling. It's probably one of those close spots. I mean, listen, if we're playing a cash game here, shoving definitely makes money. But just because it makes money does not mean it's good in a tournament setting because you really don't want to go broke near the money. And keeping 15 big blinds is a real thing. All right, here Smith raises cut off with ace five, ace five suited. Negranu calls big blind very wide with jack seven. 
even off of a shallow stack, like 30, 30 big blinds like Smith has, you may want to start making it bigger if you know the big blind is going to call you very frequently. So it's a spot where you can maybe make it bigger. You have to understand, raising small is good when your opponents are not going to 3-bet very often and when they're going to be folding a lot before the flop. I don't necessarily think that people are folding so often before the flop anymore, so that, that reasoning is kind of gone. Um, and I think you're, you're just... People are learning to play better after the flop, right? So if they're learning to play better after the flop, even out of position, you don't really want to let them get there cheaply. So if they'll call bigger raises, that allows you to get more value pre-flop. So if you can get more value pre-flop, that's great. Or if you start raising bigger and they start folding incorrectly, then um, if they start folding incorrectly, then that's fine too, right? Like let's say they start overfolding too much. All right. V Cross Poker Welcome says, this is awesome. I'm glad you enjoy it. You have to get used to the text. Yes, this is how I look at all of my hands. This is how all my students send me all of my hands. So this, this looks perfect to me. <laughs> this is how I record all of my hands. But I definitely understand the text is probably difficult for most people. I do like the text though because we have this big blank space we can work on if we need to pull up Equilab or something like that. You can just pull that up right there. And that's nice. Um, but yeah, the text is, is a barrier for some people, but hey, you either want to study here or you don't. All right, comes 8-4-2. This is a spot where Marchese should either check or bet small, and he likes to check. I'm a little bit surprised he checked. I do think you don't mind if you get random overcards to fold. We have seen Negranu taking somewhat weird lines where he's like check raising small on the flop and whatnot. If you're going to be getting check raised a lot, if you bet, then you definitely want to be checking, right? You really don't want to get check raised. So if you think you're going to get check raised, definitely check. If you think your opponent's going to do a lot of calling or folding, then you definitely want to bet. Like right here, if he knows Negrandu has jack seven offsuit and is going to fold to a bet, even a small bet, like say pot is uh, 50K, if he's going to fold to a 50K bet, or if he's going to fold to a 15k bet, that's fine. So against a normal person, I would probably just bet small in this spot and defend appropriately. But he does check. Uh, turns a 7 of diamonds, which is a pretty bad card for Dan Smith because now just like more random junk gets there. So easy check behind for him again. Negreanu decided not to lead, which I think is fine. River's a jack, so now Negreanu has two pair. He bets 35k into the 48k pot and Smith folds. That's fine. Notice here, Smith doesn't get sticky with his ace-5. He has a hand that is very easy to check down and then win at showdown. And if someone bets, usually they just have a pretty good hand. Also, this board is just bad for Smith. I mean, he does still beat hands like queen-9 that may bluff, but try to think about the hands that would even want to bluff here, right? It's going to be queen-10, queen-9. Then what? Notice 10. Where, is, where, where does the card you have to go for a 10? 10, 6? I mean, that's, I guess it's a hand. 10, 5, I guess that's a hand. These are hands that exist, but they're, notice they're, it's kind of hard to find obvious unpaired hands that would want to bluff in this spot. Um, King High may not want to bluff. If it does bluff, that's a slightly better reason to call. But even then, I think this is just an easy fold. So good play by Smith. He didn't get attached to it. All right. Schindler raises to 18K with Ace-9. Wait, one second. Ghost of M says, pretty amazing turn check. I don't, I don't, I think you need to check the turn. Uh, you don't have the best hand here very often. You do protect some by betting. It's, I guess it's kind of like the spot spot, the flop spot, where if you bet, you want to bet small. But at the same time, if you bet small on the turn, now a lot of stuff's just getting the right price to call. So I don't know. I, I don't think you need to bet the turn. I think once you check the flop, you probably should just check down. Because the ace high has some showdown value. If the river's not a bigger card than a than an eight, you could also call on a decent amount of rivers. So I, I think you're somewhat well protected by just checking. I don't think you need to bet here. If you bet, you're probably going to be in bad shape almost every time. And you also open the door to get raised, which, again, you really just don't want to get raised. And like I mentioned, Negranu has been raising a little bit more often than normal in the recent past from what I can see. All right, Schindler raises 18K with ace-9 offsuit in the low jack seat. 
Yeah, this is um, this is quite loose. But if you all know Jake Schindler, he is quite loose. Notice he's raising into Brian Rast, big blind, who I think is on the more tight aggressive side. I don't know where Tilston and Negranu are sitting. Let's see if we can can't even put it together because we don't have enough hand histories yet. But if you have the big stacks on your left, I definitely do not like Schindler's raise. If the big stacks are on your right, then I think it becomes much more reasonable. All right, Brian Rask calls big blind with pocket forwards, which is fine. 755, Schindler bets 14K into 48K, Brian Rask calls. If you remember yesterday, we had a very similar hand where I think it was Dan Smith, check, raise, small versus Negranu with pocket fours on 755. It's kind of funny. And um, Negranu called, and then on the turn, Smith bet small, and then Negranu raised with the ace-king. So very, very bizarre hand. Here we see, instead, Chandler betting his ace-nine, as he should with most of his range here. And then Brian Rass calls, but then he leads for 36K on the turn. Huh. That is weird, right? I don't really know why he's going to lead in this scenario. If you lead and get called, you have to assume you're in pretty bad shape. You're probably only going to be getting called here by like good overcards that have some sort of draw to go with them. So it's going to be like ace-9, ace-8, maybe king-9, king-8 suited, if king-8 suited even opens. Um... Obviously, every time you're beat, you're getting called. I do realize that the pocket four should actually not be beat here that often. But I still don't think you need to lead. One thing you will discover if you play around with the Game Theory Optimal programs is they don't mind leading with hands that really want protection. But I'm not sure that this is a spot for this hand. Like, I, I could see leading a hand like pocket eights here. I'm sorry, not, yeah, pocket eights on the turn. Because on the turn with pocket eights, you do have lots and lots of equity. And you also don't mind protection. Memleek says, in the big blind, he has a lot more fives. That is true, but that's a reason to check raise the flop. Not to take this kind of bizarre, small lead on the turn line. Um, if you are going to lead on the turn as a bluff, then you should be betting bigger, right? The bet size is kind of interesting too. Usually when people lead, they're either leading very small with a very wide range, mostly for marginal value, or they lead very big for, for with a polarized range, like with, with the nuts or nothing. Here, Rasp picks kind of a medium size, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because you're not really polarizing your range, but he's clearly betting with a value bet hand, right? So this is like one of these really thin value hands. So if you're leading with the really thin value hands, I think you probably want to bet smaller. But he does 36K and gets called by Ace-9. River, Rasp bets 77K. The guy who transcribes his hand histories has a hard time remembering what happens on the river, it seems. Um, I can pretty much tell you, though, that Schindler's going to call. Easy, easy call with this straight on this river when Rasp takes this bizarre line of check call flop, lead turn, and then bet again on the river. Um, we can see from the next hand that Rass lost about 100k in the hand, and Rass does lose about 100k in the hand. So story checks out. If Rass does lead the river and he gets raised, what does he do? I don't know what you're supposed to do in this spot. It would be pretty rough. The There was no backdoor spade draw. It's kind of hard for Schindler to even have a 9. You know, maybe, I was going to say, maybe Schindler should raise given given um, this is like very, very near the top of his range. But I guess Chandler could also have the boats that he would slow play on the turn. So that makes sense. Why is Chandler not raising? Because he probably thinks that Rast has taken a polarized range, a polarized betting line, where when he leads the turn, his range should be a lot of fives, right? And if his range is lots of fives, that's going to be a lot of hands that contain a full house. So... You don't want to raise in these spots because when your opponent has a better hand than you, you're pretty much always getting called. And when they have a worse hand than you, they're going to be folding very frequently. This is where a lot of people look at this scenario with hindsight and they say, oh, Rast had fours. Clearly, he would have considered calling a raise. Therefore, Mar uh, therefore Schindler should have raised. But 
We don't know that Rass has pocket fours. For all we know, he has pocket fives or pocket sixes or pocket sevens. So I definitely get why he's not raising. Again, in tournaments, it's very important to not risk your stack. How do you risk your stack? By raising thinly on the river. All right, let's see. Ghost of M says you see this kind of strange turn lead a lot in your games, but it kind of leads towards checking and deciding on the river instead of leading out again. Well, R Rass has to assume he has the best hand on the river pretty much every time. Um, I mean, he rivered a straight, right? When he rivers a straight, he is very, very happy here. He's thinking that he's going to be against a lot of ace highs and a lot of over pairs. And the over pairs are going to pay very, very frequently. Muggy says you hardly ever lead as well, but isn't it good if why now are we reviewing? You're saying if players are good, should we be doing things that confuse them? The answer to that's usually no. It doesn't matter if your opponent's confused if they know how to play good game theory optimal poker. Confusing someone is irrelevant if you are taking a hand that should be profitably played in a different manner and playing it in a suboptimal manner. I can guarantee you Schindler's not just going to all of a sudden short circuit and lose his mind because he's facing a small lead. In this spot, he should be calling. What I'll tell you exactly what Schindler's going to do here. Assuming he thinks Rast is being anywhere near balanced, he's going to look at how often he needs to defend. How often does he need to defend? About 66% of the time, give or take. So he needs to call with 66% of his range. What does that look like? That's going to look like any pair, and it's going to look like any gut shot or open into straight draw. Maybe ace, king, and ace, queen, and ace, jack. Somewhere in there. I don't know exactly what it is. You can play around with the float the turn range analyzer and see it for, see it for yourself. Okay, now on the river. Rasp bets again. Chandler needs to call about 66% of the time. He's going to look at his range, and he's going to call about 66% of the time. And that's it. Now, you may say, okay, well, then Rass, why doesn't Rass just, like, always bluff? Well, because Schindler's going to call roughly the correct amount of the time. Why does he not always value bet? Because Schindler's going to fold the correct amount of the time. And that's the problem against good players, is that if you do something odd, thinking that you're exploiting them, you're not, because their adjustment is not going to be to, you know, all of a sudden fold every time or all of a sudden call every time. It's going to be to look at their range and call appropriately. And that's why it's hard to play against good players because they're not going to make stupid errors. If you're playing against bad players who are going to make stupid errors, like say you lead the turn and they all of a sudden raise you every time because they think turn weeds are leak, or turn, <laughs> turn weeds are leak, uh, turn leads are weak, then yeah, sure. But that's you exploiting them. You're not trying to take advantage of the best players in the world by finding a gigantic flaw in their game because they don't have these gigantic flaws. They're going to play reasonably. So, no, don't try to confuse good players because it doesn't do anything. Instead, just play well. All you can do is play well. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit unfortunate, but that, that is all you can do. Your goal is to break even. Or, you know, you win if, if they happen to play slightly worse than you play. Aren't they way more likely to make mistakes in spots where they have less experience? The problem with this, this line of thought is what you're saying is they have less experience looking at their range and calling appropriately. I just told you exactly what Rash should do here on this, or exactly what Schindler should do on this turn. And I'm going to be off by like 2 or 3 or 4%. It's not that big of a deal. If I'm messing up some, it's going to be very minimal. And that's it. We've already solved this spot. It took us like one second to do it. And I, I don't know. I, I guess what you're saying is that you think that these players are all of a sudden going to make gigantic errors. But it it's really is just a factor of how often do I need to defend? Okay, defend that amount of my range. And that's it. And it's not hard to look at your range and call with, a, call with two-thirds of it. Um... I'm trying to think if there's ever spots where it may where where you can make people make mistakes. I mean, you can make people who are very exploitative make mistakes all the time. Right? But we're playing against players who are way closer to game theory optimal. We're not playing against players who are going to fold to your 3x pot riverbed every time. They're going to call appropriately. So 
that's that, that's the problem is that good players just call appropriately. They don't worry about, oh, I'm, I might bust out of the tournament on this hand or this bet's so small, the guy's obviously trying to get called. No, we're just thinking, what are the pot odds? Defend appropriately, go from there.